on my way back from August's cell, I took the long way back to my room, until I found myself standing in front of the female earthling's door. I poked my head inside and spotted the female earthling sitting in a high-legged chair, leaning over a cluttered desk. Wearing only a white t-shirt, the female earthling's arms were exposed, revealing a gruesome tattoo that ran the length of her left arm. Comprised of seven bold symbols, the tattoos rose from her skin like an old scar. Below it was a smaller tattoo, not unlike that of an earth scorpion, but with long black horns. Either come in or shut the door. The walls of her room were covered in paintings of earth trees, their branches stretching all around and onto the ceiling. Piles of hand-drawn maps sat in the far corner. Scribbled notes and elaborate sketches of creatures and machines littered all available wall space. It was a chaotic but somehow magical mess. At her desk, the female earthling tinkered with a small machine. Every few moments, sections of a song would play, then stop. Over and over, it seemed like she was working on it in some way. How did you know I was in the hall? She raised her finger to her lips. You breathe with your mouth open. She fiddled with the song a bit more, then raised her tattooed arm in tired victory. Finished. With the flip of a switch, the song filled the room with a mesmerizing, rhythmic melody. A melancholy song about voices carrying. I missed Earth music immensely and enjoyed every moment of it. And by the look in the female Earthling's eyes, it had been a very long time for her as well. For those brief moments, we left the cold confines of that spaceship and drifted in a bubble of musical bliss. She flipped another switch, sending the music echoing over the ship's intercom. I enjoyed every moment of it, but when the song faded, the female Earthling immediately went back to work. You deciphered that all yourself? Those last parts were twisted between a polka song and a local newsfeed from Calcutta. It takes the machines on Terra weeks to do what you did in... Four hours. How is that possible? Never underestimate experience. Her eyes sparkled as she leaned in close to her work. It was hard to tell if she was happy or sad. Maybe a bit of both. So, uh... Will you, um, ever go back to Earth? Let's just say the circumstances of my departure make it difficult to return. Uh, you were forced to leave. You could say that. That was when I realized she was an outcast, like me. But I wondered what circumstances forced her to leave her home. Fate! She peeked over her shoulder and pinned me with her eyes. Maybe we were supposed to meet, uh, and travel back to Earth together. With us finding August and all, it just seems like- Don't give me that fake garbage. Oh, suddenly an explosion outside the ship rattled the room. The female Earthling jumped from her seat and ran down the hall. I followed her toward the engine room, where Rusty was hard at work on a smoldering skip drive. What's the situation? The skip drive has failed, Master. Use the ball nose to tighten the lag bolts. We are also being targeted by a Huntsman mining vessel. Taranka. Rusty, get the drive back online. Use all the link bands if you have to. She slid a small flashlight device from her boot and aimed it at the ceiling. The flashlight shined straight through the ship's hull. Well, confused, I grabbed hold of the wall, fearing I would be sucked out. Soon enough, I realized I would not. The female Earthling aimed the device at the floor and searched for any sign of trouble. Where are you hiding? There! There it was. An enormous vessel resembling an angry, twisted Earth octopus. Blue flames blasted out from six massive stacks, filling space with thick, gray fumes. Smokers. This is gonna hurt. A blue light whizzed around the alien ship, then fired. I took cover as the light smashed into the hull, slowly listing our ship to one side. The jammed our navigations. 
Let's move. August banged on his cell door as we passed down the hall. What? What? What do the Taranka want? Miners. They might also want a few words with me. We stopped in front of the door that led into a circular room. Other than the floor, the small room was completely transparent. At the center stood a wide chair with a massive gun bolted to it. Ever fire a laser turret? Uh, no. She <gasps> nudged me deeper into the room. This chair controls the gun outside. Watch the monitor. Shoot anything that heads our way. I looked over the gun. So, just point and shoot? If you need anything, scream. With that, she was gone. I hopped into the chair, strangled the double joysticks, and scanned the heavens for the Taranka ship. There it was, swimming through a thick shield of smoke. I took a breath, aimed, and squeezed the double triggers. The chair shimmied, but nothing more. Frantically, I searched for a switch or a lever as the room filled with blue light swelled with heat, then shook violently. The turret chair broke from the floor, slamming me against the wall. I dragged myself from the twisted rack and slid my body into the door. Cracks raced across the floor, hissing and screeching their way toward the ceiling. I dragged myself across the ground and dove into the hall as the room tore away from the ship. I smacked the door's controls, sealing the door shut, and stopped myself from being sucked out with the rest of the room. I limped my way to the cockpit, where Rusty fiddled with a few knobs on the wall. Main centrifuge is malfunctioning, sir. Blue light filled the cockpit, followed by a chest-thumping shockwave. Prepare for the ship listed hard, and I was tossed onto the ceiling. Rusty stayed in place, as if nothing changed. Where, where is she? My master is in the engine room, sir. I scampered out of the cockpit and ran down the hall. On the ceiling, I passed August's cell, which I was shocked to find empty. The door ripped from its frame, but there was no time to investigate. Running along the ceiling, I leaped over some loosened pipes and into the engine room, where the female earthling dangled haphazardly above the skip drive. You're supposed to be on the gun. It's gone! There's another, right of cockpit. I sprinted out of the engine room, past Rusty, and found the other gun. But it was already occupied by August, who hung upside down in the gunner chair with a smile, ready for a fight. What are you doing? Saving our butts. How, how, how did you get out? Can we discuss this later? I'm kind of busy. That was when I saw it. Carved on the front of the Taranka ship. The Black Horned Scorpion. It matched the tattoo on the female Earthling's arm. The female Earthling was once a slave miner. Like the gobbles. The female Earthling's voice thundered over the intercom. Skip drive back online. Prepare for blind skip. August jumped from the gun, grabbed my shirt, and dragged me through the hall and into the cockpit. Time to get moving, Russ Pot. There are four of those blue light things heading straight for us. The cockpit filled with blue light. August stared out the window as I ducked behind his legs. Rusty held on to the controls. Camels fought. Then... Silence. D did we make it? We have blindly skipped out of range, sir. August stepped close to the window and peered out into space. So, where are we? We have skipped just outside the planet Morka, sir. Well, at least we didn't end up inside Morka. It was by far the biggest planet I'd ever seen. Dark yellow with splatters of white. The planet's surface was covered with sharp mountain ranges and oceans of black. What is this place? But before I could get an answer, the female earthling charged into the cockpit and slammed August against the window. Time to get back in your cage. Come on, Peaches. All I did was, oh, I don't know, save all of our lives. And how did you do that? Well, why don't you ask your little partner? They both turned toward me, waiting for some clarification. Well, <clears throat> when I got to the other gunner, August was already there, uh, helping. August broke loose of the female Earthling's grasp. Seems I'm not the big dumb jerk I appear to be. 
She again shoved him hard into the window. You were only concerned with saving yourself. Saving myself along with everyone else is a bad thing. Got it. Ha! That's sarcasm. The female Earthling scolded me with a look, then turned her attention back to August. You're not part of this crew. August stepped closer. You know what your problem is? You're wound too tight. August took another step, nearly making contact with her nose. You need to take some calming, deep breaths, Peaches. I quickly slid between them and shoved August away. No! Are you crazy? August leaned toward the female Earthling, nearly striking her with his nose. I shoved August in his chest one more time, keeping him at bay. Be careful, tough guy. You might accidentally kill yourself. What's that supposed to mean? <clears throat> Please, the both of you need to behave. Suddenly, we were interrupted by a strange gurgling voice that bellowed from the ship's intercom. Identify yourself and proclaim your business. The female Earthling stood at attention. Supplies needed. Identify. She quickly typed into her wrist. Confirmed. Enter at 76-432. Port 2. The female Earthling glanced out the window. We got lucky. Well, why's that? Are you joking? This is Morka. Morka spacecrafts and supplies are famous throughout the universe. Only a plague wouldn't know that. Uh, I'm proud of it. August patted me on the head. Look, little fella, I'm sure there's some advantages to being out of the loop of the entire universal community. We can't land. The gravity's too strong for my thrusters. Then how do we get supplies? They do operate a shipyard from their moon, but we need parts, not a new ship. I beg to differ. So, what do we do? August pointed at Rusty. What about Rustpot? We turned our attention to our little robot friend. Think you can handle this? It would be my, the word, pleasure, master. Thank you.